also like to invite uh, the moderator and the speakers of session five to please come over and take your seats in the sofa. We will start with the format of talk show, the Davos style format um, from session five onwards on the thematic discussions. So we have Calvin James from the Farmers Major Group moderating this session. Calvin? I think we have five um, speakers who will be participating in this um, session, leading the discussion in this session that Calvin will be moderating. We will start the, the session, um, session five on land and soil pollution by showing two videos, video clips on the situation on the use of pesticide and impacts on children, and the call for European Union governments to act on the pesticide challenge, the pesticide issue. So I think while waiting for colleagues and friends to come inside the room and take their seats, we might as well show the videos. And Calvin will start the session right after the video clips.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the fifth session uh, entitled Land and Soil Pollution. It is the first thematic uh, session for uh, this global major group stakeholder forum. Uh, colleagues, this uh, fifth session, as I indicated, it's entitled Land and Soil Pollution, which forms part of a larger process known as land degradation. As you know, land degradation uh, deals with uh, the depletion of soil and land cover. And it is part of a global thematic process that was birthed in uh, the UN General Assembly in 2015, and it forms the Sustainable Development Goal 15, land on, life on land. SDG 15 aims to protect, restore, and promote sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems, sustainably manage forests, combat desertification, and halt and reverse land degradation, and halt biodiversity loss. And so this session, colleagues, therefore, will explore some of the key issues of land degradation vis-a-vis -vis pollution, and the panel will table specific recommendations for us to consider this afternoon. With us on this panel is an August assembly of professionals in, in their own right. To my immediate left is Surenjini Rangam. Ms. Surenjini is the Executive Director of Pesticide Action Network Asia and Pacific, otherwise known as PANAP. It's a regional network that works towards eliminating hazards of pesticides and promoting agroecology. Ms. Serangini has 30 years experience undertaking research and providing training at national, regional, and international levels on community pesticide action monitoring, otherwise known as CPAM. Uh, she also is experienced in facilitating gender training and leadership building of rural women and, is instrument and was instrumental in the formation of the Asian Rural Women's Conference and Coalition. Next to Ms. Sarangini is His Excellency Dr. Wilbert K. Oh, sorry, my, my apologies. Uh, I'm skipping one. Uh, we have uh, the, a representative from the Indigenous Peoples of Asia, none other than Prem Singh Taru. Mr. Taru is the regional representative of the UN environment. He works on land, forests, and sustainable natural resource management. And he'll be speaking from an, an indigenous people's perspective as it pertains to land and soil pollution. Next to Mr. Taru is His Excellency Dr. Wilbert K. Otechilo. Uh, His Excellency is the governor of the Vihaja County Council of Governors of Kenya, and that's a local authority. Dr. Ota Chilo holds a Doctor of Philosophy degree in Natural Resource Mapping and Assessment for University of Wedging Wedge Ingham, the International Institute for Earth Observation and Geoinformation in the Netherlands. He has a master's in biology of conservation and ecology from the University of Nairobi and a bachelor's degree in zoology and botany at the University of uh, Nairobi. His Excellency uh, worked as the Director General for Regional Center for Mapping Resources for Development for the Eastern and Southern Africa which is an affiliate of UN Economic Commission for Africa. In 2007, he was elected Member of Parliament for 
M who we are constituency 2008 to 2017 and is currently the governor of the Vihaga County, Kenya. We have next to His Excellency another esteemed African, uh, Phyllis Omido, and she is the founder of the Center for Justice, Governance, and Environmental Action. Ms. Omido said that she never meant to become an activist, but after successfully shutting down a lead smelter responsible for a rampant illness and several deaths in her community in Mombasa, Kenya, she became a symbolic figure in the fight for environmental justice in the rapidly industrializing global south. If you would like to read more about uh, Ms. Umbido's work, you can go to the website www.africasuccess.org and you can find her full bio on that website. Last but not least is a colleague of mine from my part of the world, Latin America and the Caribbean, Ms. Isis Alvarez. She is a member of the Global Forest Coalition and Ms. Alvarez is from Colombia. She's a biologist. Uh, with an MSc in Environmental and Resource Management and has experience in that area as well. She has worked with the different local and international environmental NGOs in Latin America, Europe, and Africa. She has been involved in projects such as the rehabilitation of confiscated capuchin monkeys in La Macarena, Colombia, and leopard humane conflicts in the Waterberg Reserve, South Africa. And so, colleagues, if you would join me in welcoming this esteemed panel with a lusty round of applause. <clears throat> this afternoon, we will be exploring the issues surrounding land and soil pollution. Our colleagues are here to lead us in a discussion. Uh, we will kick off today's uh, deliberation with a series of questions. Uh, each panel member will have approximately four minutes to respond. They would share with you their experiences. Uh, the floor will be open to uh, have a form of interaction and we will end today's proceeding by together coming up with recommendations based on the uh, feedback from our panel. Starting on, at my very left, uh, and this question is for the entire panel. There are mics in front of you, so if any one of you would like to uh, kickstart today's discussion, We'd like to find out what are the key issues under this particular thematic session that UNEA3 should be focusing on. And the, the thematic area in question is land and soil pollution. I don't know if you'd like to kickstart discussions. Thank you, Kelvin. I think for me, uh, one major concern is the, as uh, has been described by the UN Special Rapporteur on Toxics, he called it the silent pandemic of disease and disability and the impact on children. And it's really, for me, the use of pesticides and in agricultural uh, production as well as in public health. If you look at the uh, situation of uh, land contamination, you have pesticides like DDT that are so persistent that even if you ban it today, it will be still in the soil for the next 30 years. And the breakdown products of DDT is DDD and DDE, which will even be there longer. But another concern is the deaths caused by pesticide use. 200,000 acute poisoning deaths each year. And these are fatalities that are mostly felt in 
developing countries, 99% in developing countries. There's chronic effects, cancer and Parkinson's diseases, hormonal disruption, and uh, development disorders and sterility caused by some and specific pesticides. And these are exposures of most vulnerable people, our children, our future, plantation workers, small farmers, and indigenous peoples. And these are violations of human rights. And this child, Shruti, is a survivor of endosulfan poisoning in India. And now she's a grown woman learning to be a doctor, but her friends in the community and in the nearby villages are not so lucky. They are no longer with us. <clears throat> this is followed by, the next slide please, the story of children being uh, pesticide, facing po pesticide poisoning in Kamukaan. And this is going on because of aerial spraying in the banana plantations. And many of them suffer daily because they face this kind of poisoning. And they're just a face of many, of many other children who are being affected by pesticide poisoning. Silvino Talavera died because of glyphosate poisoning. And he's from a, a community in Paraguay where soya bean, Roundup soya bean, was being, uh, was being used and they were using massive use of glyphosate, which is also uh, in, under the uh, International Agency of Research uh, on Cancers, a probable human carcinogen. So we, we see this happening and we always question, who is profiting from this? 65 billion US dollars in agrochemical and seeds and biotech are being you know, enjoyed by the big six companies. And these are Syngenta, Monsanto, DuPont, Bayer, and Dow. And they control 75% control of the global market. They know the impact of these poisons they sell, and yet they continue to sell these uh, poisons and causing untold suffering of people and environmental contamination. They even harass, vilify, and silence, and even sue human rights defenders who are critiquing uh, or uh, who are finding the, the impacts of pesticides negatively in their communities and in the uh, wildlife. So recently, the UN Human Rights Council has set up an intergovernmental working group to elaborate on a legally binding treaty on TNCs and other businesses with respect to human rights. And I think I would encourage as many governments as possible to join uh, these uh, human rights uh, uh, deliberations in Geneva where we need to have good regulations to control the human rights violations of TNCs and other businesses. Thank you. Thank you very much for that wonderful insight. I'd like to have an indigenous people's perspective on the same question. Prime, the floor is yours. Yeah. Th thank you, uh, Kalevin. Uh, in the indigenous perspectives on land and soil pollutions, the issues which uh, indigenous peoples they are facing, the when it's uh, industrial agriculture or industrial uh, plantation, that can be sugar, rubber, oil plantation, as for those for those agricultural projects, large-scale land acquisitions are done, so that's affecting to the indigenous people's land and territories. And in the meantime, there are pesticides, chemicals, fertilizers as well, uh, which are used in the industrial agriculture. And then second is, of course, the industrialization, or we, we can say corporate uh, development that can be mining uh, m omega dams, logging, tourism, or other industries. Because of the mining, there are many indigenous land and territories are changing into, uh, uh, how do you say? It's, uh, it means the indigenous land and 
territories are really uh, being affected by the mining companies. It's those minings are displacing to the indigenous, indigenous and local communities. And then another issue uh, in indigenous land and territories is, uh, uh, is militarization, war and conflict. Uh, in terms of in terms of militarization, we can see uh, some 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 uh, uh, some refugees from from Myanmar. They are coming and staying in the Thai border, and it's it's it's, it's really hard to their survival. And as and and of course, if they are displaced, then their uh, what do you say way of life. Uh, their livelihoods, their uh, food, food security is badly affected. And another uh, issue is disposal of the harmful materials in the indigenous land and, uh, land and territories. And of course, we cannot forget, uh, it's, it's, it's not only uh, the issue for this land and soil pollution, but of course it, uh, it is uh, as a major issue in, in uh, in other sectors also, policy discouraging issue means that policy uh, which has to be more land and soil friendly means should be uh, should be uh, as a as a important uh, uh, legislation to protect the land uh, uh, to protect the earth. But those land and policies are not favoring to the sustainable developments and not favoring to the land and soil uh, uh, protection. So those policies are, of course, uh, the big challenges uh, that Sharo also she mentioned. And the biggest challenge that we cannot forget is, is killing of the land and environmental human rights defenders, the people who, who, who uh, protest against the land and soil Pollution, they are blamed of different false charges and they are arrested, means they are kept in the illegal uh, detention and, and it's not only enough, they are tortured and they are killed at the inn. So there are very serious human rights violations happening uh, to, to, the, uh, to the land and human rights uh, defenders. So such cases we can, yeah, we, can, uh, uh, we can highlight as a major issue. So, uh, for now, it's enough. Thank yes, you. thank you very much, Prem. Uh, rightfully, uh, sustainable development is important as it pertains to land degradation. But from your discourse, it seems to be a human rights issue as well. I think that's very insightful. Uh, now we pass on to His Excellency. We want to welcome you. The floor is yours. Thank you. I want to note that the driving forces around land and soil pol uh, pollution as are human best. And therefore, if we have to tackle this issue, we have to change. We must have a paradigm shift, specifically in our agricultural practices. Because for many years, we have had experts advising us to increase food production through use of fertilizers, through use of chemicals. But over time, this has proved to be very futile. And now we are suffering a lot of problems due to soil and land pollution as a result of this unsustainable production systems. So for me, a paradigm shift in our production systems is a must. We must move away from these destructive production systems to sustainable production systems. And this is where we have to go back on the drawing board, look at issues like smart agriculture, conservation agriculture. How can we go back so that we can be able to minimize the use of um, 
chemicals and pesticides in our production systems. The other area of interest that we must focus on as we move on is our sources of energy because most of the energy sources are also of a paramount importance and have a, a major impact on soil and land pollution. So issues of fossil energy, how do we move away from fossil energy to renewable energy? Because all over the place, fossil energy is causing a lot of problems, including climate change. So how do we move away from these energy sources to sustainable sources? So I think this is, to me, we need a major paradigm shift as we move forward so that we can be able to alleviate or get rid of these problems which are likely to be with us for a long time to go. From the policy point of view, at the local level, it is important to have public awareness on the consequences of this use of these pesticides and the chemicals in our normal production systems and other systems that we uh, depend on. So public awareness is a very important aspect that we must uh, build within our local communities to ensure that they understand how to mitigate some of the impacts of these um, chemicals that lead to land and soil uh, pollution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. It's good to know that we have uh, politicians who, who support the civil society cause. Uh, right next to His Excellency is another African hero, uh, Ms. Phyllis uh, Omondi, and she is going to share with us her story and answer the question posed to the panel. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, the name is Phyllis Omido. Uh, I'm an environmental activist um, who was chosen by the profession. Um, the issue I would like us to, I would like you now to focus on is the issue of used lead acid battery recycling in Africa. Um, my reasons are that we have ably handled the issue of lead in petroleum. We are now working on almost eliminating the issue of lead in paint, but we are all silent about the elephant in the room, which is used lead acid uh, battery recycling, or ULABs, in Africa. We know that the West has gotten rid of its burden of toxics very well. We know that Asia has woken up and understood that you cannot um, engage in certain practices like recycling of lead and assure the population of an, a clean and healthy environment. But unfortunately, in Africa, we are left with the burden of recycling lead. Lead acid batteries are still used all over the world, and we require pure lead to produce lead acid batteries. We use lead in production of bullets, so everyone still needs to use lead. Unfortunately, Africa and I'll mention specifically my community in Owinohuru, where a lead smelting plant was set up in 2009 without prior informed consent to the community, without the participation of the community. And I will give you uh, an example of a little boy called Sami, who was exposed to lead poisoning. Sami was born into an environment that was contaminated with lead, and therefore his blood had lead. Sammy was a little brilliant boy. He died last year because his body could no longer tolerate the lead levels in his blood. Um, women have also suffered greatly 
I will give you an example of Lynette Nabuire. Lynette had tried to get pregnant three times. She had had three miscarriages. In Africa, you are expected to have a child for your husband. And so Lynette would not hear when we told her to wait because her blood level was 230 micrograms per deciliter of lead. WHO definition of lead is five micrograms per deciliter. And so she, was, she had a very toxic level in her blood. Lynette managed to get pregnant and carried her baby to term. But three days after delivery, she died and her postmortem indicated that she had died because her blood lead levels were too high and her body could not pump uh, her blood well. The highest blood lead level in my community now in Owinohuru is 420. That is um, of a woman of childbearing age, Irina Kinyi. Her thyroid has given up, and yet the soil is still contaminated. When we started advocating for the issue of lead poisoning, we were not able to test for lead anywhere in Kenya. And the first lead uh, test, including that of my son, had to be done in South Africa, where we paid more than 3,000 shillings per person, about 3,600 shillings per person, and had to wait for a week before you could get the results. Much as we have tried to push the issue now, and the government is able to test, uh, since 2015, the government of Kenya now was able to test, because prior they had written to us and said they did not have capacity to test for lead poisoning. All the hospitals in Kenya, as at now, none of them has, are able to use chelation therapy for treatment. So our people are exposed to lead poisoning, and they die in their houses without any help getting to them because Africa has not accepted that this is something that we need to deal with. Kenya has not accepted that it is something that we need to deal with. So I would ask you, Nea, to look very strongly because we have done a study in three other African countries and the study showed the same exact replication of what is happening in Oonohuru. In Kenya only, we have identified 17 communities that are suffering the same issue as what Owinohuru is suffering. All of them producing lead for export as pure lead to foreign uh, markets that do not allow production of lead in their countries or uh, uh, secondary uh, smelting of lead in their countries. So I would strongly want to push for UNEA to look at the issue of lead acid battery recycling in Africa. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> and thank you for your struggle on behalf of uh, your people and the community. Now we move uh, to our last respondent, Isis. The floor is yours. Thank you, Calvin. Uh, no, that's not the one. Oh, yeah. So I have um, one slide so you can see what I'm going to talk about. Um, uh, Basically, what I want to address today is um, the non-conventional for, non forms of pollution. So we always hear about air, air pollution, marine pollution, but there are many other forms of pollution that are not even in the agenda and that are not recognized as pollution itself, when it is actually pollution. And one of those forms that uh, increasingly is gaining more awareness is the agricultural uh, pollution. So pollution coming from agricultural practices. The agro-industrial model that we have right now for in our food systems for food production is really, really, really um, dirty. And it's not just dirty for the environment, for, but also for our bodies. So we also should talk about pollution in our bodies, just like um, Philly said, uh, how uh, how it contaminates uh, our bodies and, and leaves us to death or to terrible illnesses. So the agri agricultural sector is the sector with the biggest growth. It's increasingly growing. Uh, there is a figure that from 1990 to 2010, it increased by 8%. That was back then in 2010. 
from, ten, from 2010 to 2017, it has increasingly, gro it, it has grown exponentially, especially in Latin America. For Latin America, for a region, this is a very big problem because every time there are more conflicts for land and there is more deforestation in order to make way for uh, agricultural production. A lot of this in my region is happening because of livestock production. So what you see in the picture, it's the CAFOs or centers for, uh, center for Agricultural Feeding Operations. So the, the system that we have now, the, the system that feeds us, that we, that we actually you know, get nutrients from, that makes us uh, live and be persons and healthy persons, etc., is completely contaminated. I mean, there are a lot of issues to address in this uh, industry. And uh, okay, as you can see, the animals, there are issues of animal welfare. Animals are not allowed to be animals anymore. They can barely move. Uh, they actually don't eat what they are supposed to eat naturally, but they are injected with thousands of different antibiotics, hormones, and all of that, we are absorbing it. We, our children, is absorbing all, all of what's coming. There's the issue right now of the antimicrobial resistance uh, because, you know, because all, all this is in the food chain and then the waste end up in the water, you know, and everything is integrated. So this is a panel for land and soil pollution, but it's important also to be aware that it is in every single part of the system. So it also leads to air pollution, it also leads to marine pollution, and everything is integrated. So we do need to be more aware of how this unsustainable industry is poisoning every single uh, other component of, of the system, including the human system. So when we talk about, uh, for example, livestock production, we don't just need to th think about uh, the animals themselves, but also the, the feedstock for the animals. Actually, Paraguay is a very good example because Paraguay has the, um, the biggest concentration of, of land per capita. So it is like, I don't have the figure here right now, but like 80% uh, of the population owns less than 1% of the land. So it's, it's that uh, big of a scandal how the, prop the land is concentrated in countries like Paraguay. And Paraguay is actually the fourth exporter in the world of soy. And this soy goes to Europe, goes to Russia, goes to the US to feed the livestock in those countries. So Paraguay, uh, Paraguay's food security is completely undermined. Actually, Paraguay is one of the poorest country in the region, in Latin America. And it, there's also like a big issue for land conflict. A lot of uh, communities have been evicted. A lot of communities have been impacted uh, because of, uh, of um, pesticides, uh, spraying with pesticides. Children have died. There has been cases in the international court. So this is a very, very big um, issue. Um, so as the agricultural sector keeps on growing, then there's also the threat of the free trade agreements. Every time that, free, that when, when agricultural products enter these free trade agreements, then we will, this situation will continue to escalate. So now many countries like Paraguay are looked at just uh, providers of commodities for countries in the north. Um, then if we talk about health impacts as well, we need to think about obesity as one of the illnesses that uh, are caused because of this expansion and because of this model that doesn't really think about uh, human animal welfare, but it's just about profit. We cannot just rely on a, on a food system that, that is uh, completely inclined towards profit. There is a case, a very important case I wanted to bring up about uh, sugarcane and sugary drinks. So recently in Colombia, there was a proposal for a 20% tax on sugary drinks, but it turns out that Colombia has a very big company. So, of course, everybody knows Pepsi, everybody knows Coca-Cola. But in Colombia, there is also a big um, 
soda company that's called Postobon. And Postobon is one of the biggest conglomerates of industries, different industries in Colombia. So they have uh, cars, they have the mainstream media also. So it's very difficult because when, when a lobby group, a citizen concerned lobby group, started pushing for this tax, they were immediately persecuted. The commercial that they had put on TV was immediately banned because of the power that the, that the whole industry has in the government. And this was a big problem, big discussion. In the end, the court, the, the Supreme Court, ruled in favor of the organization that they could actually, you know, put this um, um, proposal but they were completely shut down and, did, and this was after the, the Congress uh, denied the tax for the 20%. In the meantime, we see more children with obesity and Colombia has a very big rate of diabetes as well. Um, and when you see, so this is just to bring you that, uh, the, the, that there is no polluter pays principle, you know, when these companies are polluting your body, are polluting your environment, the consumer is actually paying the price for this. So where is the, polluting, the polluter pays principle? And finally, uh, also the, the environmental defenders, so it's not just in the like people who are defending their, their territories from mining or for, from different polluting companies, they are being killed, they are being criminalized. We, we cannot just keep on seeing this happening. We need to do something about this. I mean, this is going to be UNEA, what, like the biggest environment assembly. And I don't see any sense of urgency, not at all, not even in the resolutions. I was really shocked to look at a resolution on marine litter that proposes to reduce marine litter. No, we don't need to reduce marine litter. We need to phase it out, you know? If you look at how the world is now, we really need to be very radical and we do need a, a paradigm shift. And we need to ask for this and be more strong and get mad. And I'm really mad about that. Thank you very much, Isis. Let's give the entire panel a round of applause. We've come to the end of round one. And I think the message we can take away is indeed we need a paradigm shift that will take us away from unsustainable practices that lead to land and soil pollution to a more sustainable uh, production uh, and dealing with litter in a more sustainable manner, particularly in the case of uh, lead batteries. Let's give the panel a round of applause again. Thank you very much. We will go straight into round two, and Isis, you would lead us off this time. And the question for the panel is, is your experience, or rather in your experience, how have communities and civil society organizations in your country or region been addressing the issue? And we would probably not take a academic approach, but we would like you to cite specific cases uh, as to how either your organization or other organizations have been dealing with uh, the issue of land and soil pollution. Isis, you want to kick us off? Phyllis. Oh, yeah, you can say anyone, yeah. You go first. Go ahead, yeah. <laughs> Phyllis, you can go ahead. All right. Um, so in the Wunohuru community, the first thing we did in 2010 was to, was to start organizing ourselves into groups that would then approach the state uh, to bring up the issue of lead poisoning. Um, this approach did not work uh, because we sent letters, we picketed, um, but there was nothing that was happening from government because this was a state licensed smelter and behind it was uh, political power that we could not um, live up to. Actually, in 2011, I was arrested because of bringing up the issue of uh, lead acid batteries. And uh, I was charged with inciting violence and illegal gathering of the community. And so we have been met with violence, even when we planned peaceful protests. Um, but we have kept 
we have kept pushing through organizing and picketing. But after we, um, I was acquitted in 2012, we decided to go for a more quiet approach. And we went through, uh, number one, we did petitions to the Senate in Kenya. And the Senate addressed our issue by producing a report. We were not satisfied with the report. And so we approached Parliament. Uh, Parliament set up a task force of experts from different uh, government agencies to address our issue. And they came up with the report. But the final response we got, this was in 2015, and the final response we got from government in 2016 was this report is not for public consumption. And therefore, we have no access to this report. And nothing has been done about this report. In 2000, uh, this year, when we tried to push around the issue, we were told polluter pays principle. But in 2012, government helped the corporation that was polluting to merge into another corporation. We went through the East African community and uh, implemented a ban on lead export from Kenya, from East Africa, because now we, we had no options. Our people were dying. Our children were being killed. The women could not carry their babies to term. So we became radical and uh, got a ban on lead export from Africa. And that way, the people who were producing the lead were not able to access the markets. And so we got many of them to shut down. I know three shut down in Mombasa. Um, that was a good strategy. However, we are yet to address the issue of the pollution in the soil. So we have, uh, according to Kenyan Constitution Article 42, assures you of a right to clean environment, but Article 69, 70, you have to go through the court. The court processes in Kenya are very slow. And while we have put a class action suit in court, we do not have the corporations because government says polluter pays, but they have facilitated the exit of the polluter. We do not have the muscle to follow the polluter to their country to ask them to pay. We are trying to hang on to the owner of the premises where the polluter was located. The court process is, is tedious, it's costly, and it's not um, effective for the community because as we go through court processes, people are still dying. So for me, it's a moral issue that member states should raise up to their moral obligation, their social contract to the people of their countries and implement that. They do not need to be pushed to do that. It is a moral issue and that's how the member states should look at it. Thank you. Yeah, Isis? Thank you. Yes, I completely support what Phil just said. Um, so, um, the, um, for example, in our case, we have a project running that is the Community Conservation Resilience Initiative. There, we have found that there are lots of links to pollution uh, and how communities are getting together to actually uh, curb this pollution. They're, uh, for example, doing clean, cleanups, uh, reforestation. Uh, also, there are initiatives uh, like in Santander in Colombia for um, strengthening the farmers' markets and having more support for agroecology markets and agro agroecology products. Uh, also, consumer awareness campaigns. Those are really important because people completely ignore what's in their food. You know, the 70% of the antibiotics consumed in 2015 in the U.S. all went to live livestock for livestock treatment, 70% alone. So consumer needs, the consumer needs to know this. They need to, 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 to be aware and to request and demand the governments to be accountable for what they allow and what, and what they don't allow. Um, there have been, as I just mentioned, the Colombia case with the sugary drinks. There is an issue with uh, how the government does not support the consumer, but actually persecutes them. 
I don't know how to solve this. There are so many interests at, at the top level. I think it's really difficult to address that if there is no sense of urgency and if there's not like an ethical consciousness of, of what really is happening with this, with this topic of, of pollution. So I think a lot, of, uh, a lot of the solutions, of the real solutions, because many of them are being relied on, on, on different technologies that, that haven't been tested, that actually can bring more problems. So instead of like relying on these technologies coming from, from the global north, we should also look at the everyday life solutions and support uh, farmers markets and support all the local <clears throat> initiatives that can you know help to have a better uh, a better a better agro agricultural system uh, and also in the sense of uh, cattle raising for example in India they used to have I don't know how many hundreds of breeds of cattle but right now some species have even gone extinct because only the commercial species are looked at and uh, there has been, you know, a tradition of, of, uh, of pa pastoralists, a tradition of pastoralists that is starting to disappear. So we need to go back to, to these local, uh, more environmentally friendly practices. Thank you very much, Isis. Local solutions. Your Excellency. Thank you. Um, I would like to give a few examples where we have uh, initiatives that are trying to address this uh, problem at the local level. As you are aware, most of the counties in the country now are res responsible for agriculture and they are also responsible for waste management. So now the domain of agricultural production is in the hands of the county governments. And I'm aware that quite a number of county governments, including my county, we have taken up this matter very seriously. Uh, the issue particularly of um, land and soil uh, pollution, we are trying to address the issue uh, through a, a lot, uh, different interventions. First and foremost, we are putting up regulations on how to handle this issue. And also, we are putting up public awareness within the policy on how to create awareness on this matter. As regards to agriculture, we are moving away from a strict use of pesticides and uh, fertilizers and promoting use of uh, fertilizers that are more friendly or fertilizer that have less chemicals, mainly organic fertilizers. And we have companies in this country that are now producing fertilizers at, that are less, have less uh, chemical components, are more of organic than inorganic. So we are moving towards organic farming as a long-term solution. Also, because most of our soils have become acidified as a result of long-term use of all these fertilizers for many years, some of the counties I'm aware of, including mine and other counties like Kakamega, Transoya, we have we instituted a program whereby we are trying to treat the soils through um, use of lime so that the soils can be uh, released of chemicals and uh, become life again and be able to be used. So that we have that program that is ongoing, but it's a program that is going to take uh, a long time uh, to actually to, uh, to have a major impact. The other issue that is of great concern to most county governments is to ensure that we have clean water because most of our water uh, sources have been polluted as a result of all this infiltration of these chemicals in our water sources. So 
there is programs within many counties in this country whose program is to ensure that we conserve water catchment areas and in areas where we have a disposal of waste in these rivers, the people who do so are penalized or are punished. So we are coming up with the very punitive regulations whereby those who break the laws of continuing to pollute water resources are punished as severely as possible. The other area that is of concern that is being addressed at the local level is the e issue of uh, electronic waste management. Because right now, even at the village level, we have literally everybody has a mobile phone or any of these electronic gadgets, radios, TVs, and so on. And how these are eventually disposed is a major concern. And so, as many uh, governments at the local level are coming up with the policies and legislation on how to deal with these uh, very dangerous um, uh, uh, waste materials which have to be handled, handled in a very uh, careful manner. So there is effort that is being made, but as I said earlier, it's going to take a long time for us to realize a major impact. But the most important thing is that we must confront this problem. Yeah. The problem is, is here with us, and unless we take action now, we are going actually to destroy our own environment, our production systems, and we are going to suffer even more than right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. In terms of experience uh, from indigenous communities on the land and soil uh, protection, indigenous peoples, they have been practicing their one indigenous way of life with their customary practices of land and uh, land and resources that those practices are environmentally very friendly and then sustainable. And another thing is indigenous peoples, they, they, they do traditional farming. Their traditional farming it's 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 uh, it's relating to means it's it keeps the uh, relation with their culture, their identity, their traditional knowledge, their customs, their spiritual beliefs. So of course, all those things respect to the land and soil, and that never uh, make any harms to the to the land and soil. And another practice, uh, indigenous peoples they do flow uh, seasonal calendars for for their farming. They use their traditional seeds and, and, and traditional technologies. Those, those things never can be uh, harmful or never can be a risk uh, factor for land and soil pollution. So all these things are helping to protect the land and soil. And in the meantime, indigenous peoples, they, they, they don't use the pesticides. They do, very, uh, they, they do farming in their very traditional uh, indigenous way because they, they produce the biofertilizers uh, in very natural way in, in their home. Uh, and, 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 and another thing, indigenous peoples, they, they preach up the water because they worship the water, they have spiritual beliefs on water, and they have also spiritual beliefs on, uh, on the forest. So they, they, they do the plantation of the trees, they preserve the forest. So preserving of water and forest that ultimately helps to, the, helps to protect the land and soil from any kinds of pollutions. So these are the things, uh, these are the practices indigenous peoples are they are doing. Uh, and of course, uh, while indigenous peoples uh, do these practices, they, they are, uh, uh, means, uh, they are protecting their land and uh, land uh, territories and uh, resources with their sweat, blood and uh, blood and tears. So it has the connection and uh, being uh, protected with their one 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 traditional uh, systems. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Pram. I think um, one of the clear things that we have realized um, in in order to deal with some of these issues is that we really need to have uh, communities organized. Um, and therefore, the uh, strengthening of 
the communities and the uh, uh, masses, like uh, plantation workers, indigenous uh, peoples, um, and rural women, uh, agricultural workers, it's really important that they are uh, aware, made aware of the issues, and uh, are strengthened their, in terms of their uh, capacity and their uh, organizing uh, skills. And I think that's one of the things that we as PAN have been working with uh, groups, groups on the ground, uh, working with uh, these communities. I think that for me is a very important aspect of addressing these issues, that the, uh, the actions have to come from bottom up and that the strength of the communities has to be um, something that has to be projected and, you know, and they will make the changes on the ground. Uh, and, I, and I think that's our belief. So one of the things that we started was in order to move uh, the issue of uh, highly hazardous pesticides, and my experience coming from uh, Malaysia was the uh, situation of expansion of the oil palm plantations, where huge uh, forest lands were cut off, uh, land was grabbed from the indigenous people's uh, communities, and oil palm companies just came in with concession, concessions, and they planted this. And then they needed workers uh, to spray pesticides to harvest the oil palm. And these uh, workers were treated so, there was so much of abuse. One of the pesticides that we found uh, was a problem was a herbicide called paraquat. And this was produced by Syngenta, which is based in Switzerland. And so one of the um, local groups decided that in order to convince government, to convince uh, you know, the public, we need to do documentation. And through the documentation, this was documentation done by oil palm plantation workers, uh, looking at their own, uh, the impact of uh, pesticides on their health. And we, we want, I wanted to use this paraquat as an example because it binds with soil and is persistently sitting in clay soil for, you know, uh, more than 10 years, even decades, unless, you know, and so that becomes a real issue uh, in terms of uh, land and soil uh, pollution. But paraquat is also able, is, uh, can poison uh, workers with one teaspoon, it can cause fatality. And so the documentation was very important. And so we took two years actually to discuss, to um, you know, uh, work with the workers, uh, to have them do self um, uh, they, they do their own self-documentation. Uh, Every time they spray, spray pesticides, they come back and they document the impacts, the signs and symptoms, and we link it up with the, uh, the scientific uh, information and data available in terms of paraquat and its impact. And we were able to document, but it took us two years. And we were able to convince government, we talked to the Labour Ministry, the Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Health, and, and the first time this kind of documentation was available and they were shocked. And later, within about a year, we actually had an announcement that Paraquat is going to be banned. Now, we're dealing with the oil palm plantation, and M Malaysia is, you know, we always call it Malaysia Inc., where you have this... Um, uh, investment by the government to the uh, certain industry. And I think the oil palm industry is one of the most important for us in terms of the economy, and therefore um, the oil palm industry said, no, we need paraquat. And Sinjanta said, you know, paraquat is safe, so what are you talking about? And therefore, uh, there was so much of pressure on the, the pesticides board, the Ministry of Agriculture, and it went up to the Prime Minister. And we... Um, and we actually had one time a medical a doctor who was our prime minister who supported the ban, but he left. And so we lost the, the ban. And now we are still fighting. It's a struggle. But we have uh, uh, 2020, they said they're going to announce the ban of Paraquat, and we, we are putting pressure. So one of the things that we realized that in order to uh, move this, it took us two years to document. And that's, you know, people feel, oh, it's a bit old. And therefore, now we have what we call a CPAM, Community Pesticide Action Monitoring, mobile application, 
which once the, the workers or the farmers or the local CSOs fill up the forms, take photos, they can actually upload it into the uh, a database, which can analyze real time, and you can have you can have the information. It took us, you know, manually to you know do the the uh, documentation, but now we have a mobile application, and it's just been uh, completed. We did we had to do a pilot, and you know it took a bit of time, but it's completed, and we're very excited that we will use this. So that's one of the learnings from this uh, uh, this this uh, this experience on the ground. The second, we I wanted to just say that. Uh, one of the things that we're seeing, a lot of children are being, uh, you know, poisoned. Because in Asia and in many uh, agrarian uh, countries, uh, economic uh, uh, countries, the farms are next to schools or where, you know, uh, families live. And therefore, children are being, uh, you know, exposed and uh, affected. And so we said, let's have an awareness building looking at, protecting our children from toxic pesticides. And that's a campaign that is ongoing. And one of the uh, things that we are doing is to call for uh, uh, buffer zones. Buffer zones around schools. We are hoping that it will be one kilometer because I think you know some of the pesticides do have more than a ki one uh, kilometer uh, spray drift. But we felt that one uh, kilometer would be a starting point uh, to help uh, to protect our children as one, as one uh, demand to local government. And I'm very happy to hear from uh, our friend, our honorable uh, rep from uh, Kenya, that you're doing so much in terms of moving away from this kind of, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, industrial, uh, you know, agriculture. Finally, I just want to add that uh, we think that, uh, two things actually, very fast. Uh, I just want to support uh, our representative from uh, Kenya and Prem and all the panels here because local um, production that is uh, organically done, that is agroecologically um, viable, um, that is, you know, that does not use pesticide and massive fertilizers is possible. And we've documented globally that this works and that it's not just small one farmer or two farmers but thousands of farmers who are actually uh, practicing agroecology and practicing uh, organic farming. And I think uh, we can move away from this unsustainable, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a long way, but we, we, I think we need to uh, move forward in terms of agroecology. Finally, I just want to uh, emphasize the call of the special rapporteur on the right to food, who said that you know uh, pollution does uh, massively affect food security, and therefore we need and food and the right to food, and therefore we need to uh, move towards a comprehensive binding treaty to regulate the highly hazardous pesticides throughout its life cycle, and based on human rights principle. I think that's one of the uh, recommendations that uh, we would like to put forward yeah. uh, in this uh, discussions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Let's give the panel a round of applause. You have heard the issues, you have heard their stories. Now we want to open the floor for a time of interaction, 10 minutes. What we can definitely take away from what we have heard so far is that if the land is sick, the environment is sick and our health suffers. We have a question across here. State your name and... Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mine is not a question, it's just a comment. My name is Gertrude Kenyanji, I'm from Uganda. And my comment is that clearly from what the grassroots voices are saying, pollution is a governance issue, it's a human rights issue, it is a gender issue. Having had Helda in the morning and now Sarah, speak, I'm incensed that pollution increases the unpaid care work burden for women. When people become ill from pollution, it's the women who will take care of them. Having seen pictures presented by Valentine this morning, I'm dismayed that people have to travel from Europe to build ecosan toilets in Africa. So while there's a glaring political expedience taking precedence of good, responsible judgment. 
institutions in Africa are not independent. Uh, for example, national environment management authorities mm -hmm. cannot exercise their independence of mind and action. They have to please the appointing authorities uh, and do what they are told to do. So for me, and this is in conclusion, for me, I call upon, uh, I would like us to call upon governments. We are civil society organizations, non-state actors or major groups to demand that our governments, which are UN environment member states, should use the human rights based approach to respond to pollution. They should protect and respect our right to a safe and healthy environment by not licensing or hobnobbing with polluting corporations. And they should fulfill their obligations to, pro to, uh, to provide us a safe environment by taking positive action to facilitate us, the people, to drive back pollution. OK, thank you very thank much. You. Uh, let me uh, just state that we will not be able to take statements. Let's leave that for when we start our discussions, negotiating discussions. Uh, I'll only be able to take two questions. I'll take this on the one on the side. And any on the side? No? Okay, so I'll one more question here, and that's it. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much indeed. Very nice panelists. I just have one short just question. Just your name. And my, name my name is Professor Atemu Michieka, University of Nairobi, and Honorary Secretary to the Kenya National Academy of Sciences, Nairobi. A short question. Policies like our governor said, how do you actually implement or execute those policies that work? You do have answers in every discussion you have made. How do the people in the grassroots effect, work, enforce those policies which they know are even right, but they just abuse them? Okay, before His Excellency takes that question, we'll have the last question. Yes, thank you, moderator. I'm Penny Natwine from Uganda. Uh, me, I, I wanted to highlight on the issue of women. In Uganda, we know that women are the people mostly engaged in agriculture. And when it comes to policy making and pathing of regulations, we are not included anywhere. We don't know anything, and we are not actually uh, hoped by government to deal away with this. So what plan or what statement should we make for government to do so that it can help women, like maybe getting them involved in such decisions? Thank you. Okay, Your Excellency. Thank you for those very good questions. Um, the issue of policy is very um, complex, but also can be very simple depending how you handle it. Uh, according to our constitution, um, policy formulation in this country now starts at the grassroots. And therefore, any policy at the county level must emanate from the people themselves. So the first thing to do is once a problem has been identified, like this problem we are discussing on pollution. It is the government, the county government, to come up with a program on how a policy should be formulated through participatory process. And through that participatory process, people spell out what the policy should entail, and then again they spell out how it should be implemented with them being the key players. So this is how we are ensuring that a policy that is spelled out by the people, the people themselves must also commit on how it is going to be implemented. So this is a process that we've started for the last five years, and we believe in the next probably five years, uh, things will improve, and people will take care of their own destiny themselves. Okay, thank you. You want to take the other question? A woman's involvement in, no? Yes. All right, so the question from Professor Njeka, if I got it right. 
how do you implement policies at the grassroots? Yeah. So, for example, in Kenya, there is, uh, we are assured of the right to a clean and healthy environment, yes, under Article 42, yeah? But obviously, it's not actually implemented. So we have taken a rights-based approach where we are challenging issues of procedural environmental rights. That is access to information, public participation, and access to effective remedy, where we are asking before you set up the plant, did you involve us? in the process. If you did not involve us, that makes the whole process illegal, the licensing process, because the EIA process also has a large aspect of participation where the community is supposed to, get, to be involved before the licenses are issued. And then when the licenses, before the licenses are issued, they are supposed, the, the EIA is supposed to be circulated within all the state agencies so we, we at the grassroots have taken up the responsibility of following these processes and highlighting where they have been violated and clinging on to that as a way of accessing effective remedy. Um, so if we want to challenge a certain uh, entity that is polluting, the first thing we look at is the setting up of the industry, the commissioning and the decommissioning of the industry. Were they done according to the law? Because we know Kenya has very good laws, but there's no implementation. So what we are pushing for is implementation from the grassroots of what is already there. The challenge is we are getting very bright people who are now trying to change laws to exclude us. But so far, that is what we've been doing. Thank you. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, we would have to end that, this session because of time. We want to go into round three. And our panel, they're going to share with us some recommendations, which I think has already been beginning. There's a beginning of articulating of these recommendations. After which we'll take two questions. I saw a question to the back, that's after this round. So I will give the floor to uh, my colleague who will begin this third round of discussion on specific, one specific recommendation you would like to take away or give to uh, the, the plenary as to how we, we deal with uh, land and soil pollution. I think one uh, specific one one specific uh, recommendation would be the uh, as I mentioned the comp comprehensive uh, binding treaty to regulate highly hazardous pesticides that pollute soil and the uh, land, and uh, this is. Uh, you know, important that it's done throughout the life cycle and that it is uh, under the, uh, with the view of uh, human rights. Uh, and I think that's uh, very crucial. And as part of that, uh, often when you, you know, you ask for um, phase out of certain chemicals, you always ask for solutions. And, uh, and therefore, the whole question of uh, including in that recommendation the, uh, the, uh, ad towards advancing agroecology, and that is uh, based on farmers' knowledge and farmers' uh, awareness and uh, their skills and uh, uh, local knowledge, I think it's very, very uh, critical. Thank you very much. Let's hear the indigenous people's perspective. Yeah. Uh one is strong recommendation on behalf of uh, indigenous communities is uh, it should be ensured the land rights of indigenous, uh, indigenous peoples envisioned by, by uh, United Nations yeah. articulation on the rights of indigenous peoples because free for from consent and self-determined development, uh, these both are really the human rights uh, perspectives that need to be sure, uh, need to be ensured as the, as the human rights at the at the as the Indian people's land right. Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you. I would like to still recommend that we need a serious paradigm shift in our production systems, particularly in agriculture. We should shift away from chem chemical based agricultural production to organic farming. Thank you. I think that's one area. The other area of importance is, again, as regards to energy, we must enforce and move away from fossil energy so that we focus on the development of renewable energy. Thank you very much. Uh, I 
my recommendation would be that we need to come up with a resolution on ULABS. I know that UNEP adapted the issue of ULABS last year, and then uh, UNEP too. And so it's, there is urgent need for us to come up with a resolution on use lead acid batteries globally. And uh, the other one would be that we need to push member states to adapt a rights best approach okay. to environmental protection. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Isis? Yes, so um, specific recommendations are also about transforming the agricultural sector, uh, changing consumption habits, and this uh, goes in hand with a strong uh, consumer awareness campaign that should be supported by national and international uh, policies. Um, traditional rotation cattle raising methods and using traditional knowledge in the different agricultural practices, redirect subsidies from industrial production to support small producers, yeah, using improved environmentally conscious practices, and governments need to recognize small scale solutions. Um, also, governments need to recognize that agricultural policy can be based on free trade, but uh, rely more on cleaner production of food in all stages to address the issue of gender because, uh, for example, in the agricultural sector it's still a little bit invisibilized, it's not uh, really much visible, so there is need to have a more gender awareness on the different data that's being collected. Um, the, I, wanted to, I forgot to mention this case, but uh, in uh, Rio Verde, in Mato Grosso, in Brazil, the levels of pesticides in breast milk have surpassed every, you know, like no, known level uh, for, for humanity. And, you know, this is really terrible. Um, and they have, uh, there have been campaigns and all at the local level, but still nothing happens. You know, the same practices remain. Thank you. Let's give our panel a round of applause. I think we have a clear platform on which we can go forward. Uh, one question to the back, well, two questions. Peter, then my colleague to your left, or right, sorry. Thank you, Chair. Peter Denton, representing the United Church of Canada. When I was here in 2013, I got into an argument with the chief scientist of UNEP at the time, and he was saying that we needed to feed the world. And my response was we needed sustainable agriculture. And I'm a little concerned in terms of our conversations around pollution that it is very easy to get focused on individual uh, problems in local areas without seeing that larger picture. And I would ask the panel to reflect on whether we really have a, a paradigm shift here, but the paradigm shift needs to be from what you might call desperation agriculture, whether that's at a subsistence level or because of economics or whatever else, towards sustainable agriculture and how we manage to convey that larger uh, ideological shift to the governments at UNEA. Yes, colleague, I'll take your question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Olga Spiranskaya and I represent IPAN and ICOR Accord. Um, so uh, first of all, thank you very much for your inspiring interventions and recommendations. So Sarah, uh, you recommended um, an agreement on HHPs. And um, I'm just wondering, so um, we, we do have, for example, the Rotterdam Convention on prior informed consent. And under this convention, uh, countries were trying to include paraquats on the list of the convention for, I don't remember for how many years, without success. So do you think that one of the recommendations could be just to speed up uh, the listing of such highly hazardous pesticides under, under, under the Rotterdam Convention, as well as under the Stockholm Convention, of course. But uh, the Rotterdam Convention is very much focused on pesticides and prior informed consent. Do you think that if enforced, this uh, convention could be a good mechanism? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Olga, for that question. And I completely agree that uh, the Rotterdam Convention, the listing of uh, pesticides and chemicals have been um, kind of uh, made difficult 
because of a process that where one country can actually block the listing. And therefore, uh, a way forward is really important. And I think there's some discussions uh, at the African uh, level, the African governments are very um, uh, eager to actually move this forward uh, so that the, um, you know, a process that could, you know, move this forward uh, would be much, much uh, better. And I think there's some discussions going on. Uh, and I think that um, Rotterdam Convention is actually only on for information sharing. And that if a, a pesticide or a chemical is listed, then there shouldn't be any problem. It's not a ban. It's just making sure that the full data, toxicological and uh, environmental uh, impacts are more uh, available to countries who are concerned about that particular pesticide or chemical. And so it's really for information sharing and that uh, governments actually should be encouraged to support this uh, listing of chemicals and pesticides in the Rotterdam Convention because that helps countries to deal with some of their problem uh, pesticides and chemicals. Thank you. Thank you very much. And His Excellency will take the first question. Thank you. I just want to comment on the issue raised as regards to the use of pesticides and um, um, fertilizers as uh, one way of increase of food production. Yes, that has been used for quite a long time, but then the consequences have become quite evident. And as technology and knowledge expands, there are many ways of dealing with pesticides and chemicals. For example, um, recently in Kenya we had a wide epidemic um, a problem of fall armyworm. And all chemicals were tried, but it didn't work. But it came out simply ecologically, they found out if you do mixed cropping, then you get rid of the fall armyworm. So there are many ecological pro, um, uh, methods that can be used to deal with some of these um, uh, problems of pest uh, instead of using pesticides. Also, um, over time, it's been demonstrated in many areas that organic farming is a success and is doing very well. And if you go in the countryside, there are quite a number of farmers who have converted from using inorganic fertilizers to organic, uh, to organic fertilizers, and the production actually has improved, and the environment has also improved. So yes, it is true that over time, we can change the practices. Thank you. Thank you very much. And on behalf of uh, the major group and stakeholder forum, we would like to thank our esteemed panel. Were they, did they meet your expectations? Then show your appreciation by giving them a huge round of applause. Thank you very much. And I thank you for your attention and your questions. This brings to the end of session number five. Thank you very much, Calvin, and thank you very much to the speakers of session five on land pollution. Uh, sorry to disappoint you. Those who are looking forward to the health break, there won't be any <laughs> because we're running late. Uh, well, we're encouraging you to stand up, move around, go to the restroom, grab some bite and come back. But since we want to really catch up, we have two more sessions to go. And we're supposed to end by 6.45. We'll, we're actually ending by 7 uh, because of the Mentimeter. So we're proceeding right away to session 6 on marine pollution. I'd like to request Sasha Gavison of the Women in Europe for a Common Future and the Women Major Group um, to come forward and her, her panel of speakers and resource persons um, in front. Um, Sasha will be moderating the session with four distinguished resource persons. While we're moving around and um, herding speakers, inviting speakers to come forward, we will be showing two um, short videos, video clips 
on marine pollution, the issues and actions. But first on issues. We'll be showing two more video clips at the end of the talk show uh, to highlight two um, specific examples and cases of actions led by civil society and, and communities to address marine pollution. So I give the floor to Sasha. Wait, the video, Sasha. Hello, hello. Can you